We, we can't hear you. Yeah, unmute yourself, Father. <laughs> and I was doing so well for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but nobody knew it but you. <laughs> exactly. Sorry about that. So good afternoon, everyone, and good evening and good morning if you're watching this again on YouTube or you'll be watching this again on Facebook Live. We are still in Exodus chapter one. Uh, we've been doing some background on the text of Exodus, uh, especially who the Pharaoh was. That's the last time we were in Bible study, we talked about that. We talked about how the Exodus, uh, how the book of Exodus and the five books of Moses came about. We talked a little bit about that. But now we're going to get into the meat of the text. So Genesis chapter, I mean, Exodus chapter one, excuse me. And we are on, let me get to our page number for our study guide. We are on page 15 in your study guide, page 15. And we are in chapter one of Exodus. We're actually gonna get in to the meat of chapter one today of the text. And so I will read Exodus one, chapter one, one through 13, and then we'll get into our, our studies today. These are the names of the sons of Israel. That is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the works in the fields. They were ruthless in all of their demands. So if we go to our, on uh, letter E, capital letter E on page 15, we are going to deal with the Pharaoh's immigration policy and plan. And if you look at this, especially on page 16, you do have a, a recitation of the verses we just read. Um, we look at this, where the new Pharaoh, remember we last week, go look earlier in your study guide, we kind of put out who, who may have been the Pharaoh at the time or not. Remember that most, um, most scholars here or there will say that it was Ramses II, others say other people. We, we presented that information last week. But the Bible says, at least Ramses II during the time of the Exodus, so it might have been his father, Seti I here, that the new Pharaoh refuses to acknowledge Joseph. Remember, we talked about Joseph and what he did to save Egypt, who was um, a slave immigrant 
cont contributor to Egyptian society. Now, the reason we put slave and immigrant because in many cases, uh, Joseph covers both. He was a, he was a, it was forced immigration into Egypt because he was sold into slavery. And one of the things that notice what this Pharaoh did, he did not acknowledge what Joseph did. He did not take notice. Uh, some translations like we read didn't know, but that's not the force of the text. The force of the text is this, is that he knew, and yet he did not acknowledge. He knew of the history of what uh, Joseph, this Israelite, did and saved the nation. He knew the history, but he decided to deny the history for his own agenda. We get in trouble when we try to deny the history of the past for our own agenda in the present moment. What you have here is Pharaoh is going to reshape the narrative. And so we tend to forget or not acknowledge the benefits of those people, the others, without whom we would not be able to survive. Remember, the Israelites took care of the flocks of Pharaoh. Remember, if we go back to our Joseph story, if you go back into Genesis, uh, the Pharaoh then told Joseph, hey, if, if your, your people are good at being shepherds, they're known as being shepherds, then they can help take care of my flock. And so there was this contribution of immigrant and slave to society, and yet... Uh, this Pharaoh said uh, he wasn't going to acknowledge the contributions of those who, quote unquote, made Egypt great again and again and again and again. And so if you notice in this text, Pharaoh redefines his own people as the minority who will be overtaken by the increasing threat of these foreigners in the land. Look what he says in verse, um, verse 9. He, he being Pharaoh, said to the people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we. Here he is, the most powerful empire in the known world. He is, he is the head of the household of Egypt. Remember we said Pharaoh means household. And yet he is pointing to those foreigners over there. Uh, they're, they're outnumber us. Meaning this, Pharaoh is going to define himself and the Egyptians as what? Minorities. We're the victims here. You know, they're coming into our land and take over. So what? What does he say in verse 10? We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. Does that vaguely sound familiar? Nothing changes in thousands of years, does it? You know, we begin with not acknowledging uh, the contributions of people into our society then we begin to demonize them, and then we begin to play the victim. And if you notice, Pharaoh redefines the Israelites as the nation of Israel. Look what he does. And, and yes, the Bible um, does talk about this, you know, that they would, that they came in to the nation of Egypt and God, God promised them that they would be a prosperous nation. In fact, you know, they are fulfilling the, fulfilling the mandate of Abraham, that they become numerous. Remember, Abraham, God told Abraham that the, the Israelites will become numerous and they will become a great nation. They'll become a great people. But Pharaoh identifying them as a nation now has grounds to, quote unquote, go to war with them. That, that they've become a great nation. They're a threat 
to our national security. They are coming in and taking over and we don't want them foreigners coming in and taking over our land, do we? And so if you look at this, Pharaoh, and we're still on page 16, uh, we are in the third bullet point, Pharaoh re redefines the Israelites as a nation of Israel that has become too numerous and must be stopped. All regimes and dictators redefine the other in derogatory terms in order to justify oppression and degradation. Hitler did this in Nazi Germany with the descendants of these same Israelites. We have done this in the United States with those from Islamic countries or calling immigrants from Mexico as thugs and rapists. We have done this with our own African-American communities to deny rights and to shoot on demand. I told you nothing changes in thousands of years. The same old plan just gets reworked over and over and over again. So if Pharaoh in his policy, in his uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, media blitz, so to speak, his propaganda can get up there and say, you know, these are, these are uh, thugs and these are uh, rapists and, or, or in this case, they have become more numerous. The Israelites have become more numerous uh, than us. They're going to take over our land, and we just can't let them take over our land because we're the ones in power. Because even in those days, you still had this in and out of flow out of Egypt. People would come in and out asking for help because they were the empire of the day. You know, we saw it with Abraham, we saw it with Joseph, and now. The Egyptians want to close up their borders to protect themselves. But what do we do with these people that live on the outskirts of our land in the land of Goshen? Goshen was the land that kind of basically um, bordered uh, Egypt. And that's where the Israelites um, settled under Joseph. And so... If you look at this, the Pharaoh and Egypt must stop the increase in numbers and statue and stature of the Israelites because they may side with our enemies in war and overtake the land in an uprising. So that's what they're really afraid of. They're afraid that the Israelites will side with other peoples. And, and if they unite with those other peoples, then these other peoples will come in and take over our land. Honestly, we see this even today uh, uh, in the way that it's worked, in the way that the American empire has denied rights uh, to citizens and non-citizens in, this, in our own country and how it divides people. For example, you divide poor whites and African-Americans and Latinos from ever coming together because if they come together and realize that they are feeding off of crumbs from the table, then people may realize, hey, there's a table, we need to follow the crumbs. And if they don't want us at our table, at the table, then we make our own table. And so, you know, post-Civil War, post-Civil Rights, even in our own day, we see that in times of Reconstruction, and as Dr. Barber says, that we are in the time of the Third Reconstruction, that after the Civil War and the Civil Rights, and now uh, really in, a, in this time of revolution even now, that the way you get, uh, the way you conquer your enemies is what? You divide and conquer. So you, you tell uh, people who feel disenfranchised who are citizens of the land, hey, those foreigners, them people over there who don't look like you are getting your stuff. So we've got to fight against them. 
So what happens, it, 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 it brings an identity, a national identity of who are, in this case, the real Egyptians. And the real Egyptians need to come against these Israelites who are invading our country. Now notice what the Israelites will take away. They will take away, as the Pharaohs say, that which is more precious to us, power, prestige, and prosperity. These are the three things that we worship. This is the Trinity in our country. This is the Trinity of civil religion, power, prestige, and prosperity. That the civil religion of our day will, will fight to protect because we don't want to ever share our power, our prestige, our prosperity. Because that would mean that others would have the same privilege of the benefits of which we share. So the, 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 the people in power, so to speak, define the narrative, and they also begin to define the resources. And they usually get people to fight over the resources in order to have control. We see this, like I said, in the Egyptian empire of the day. You also see this even in our own day. In our own day, this same strategy is being used to divide us against one another. Because if those on the lower caste system in any country come together and begin to demand their rights and to begin to collaborate and organize, they become a threat to the power structure. And if you notice, you know, we don't want them uprising against us. We don't want them starting a revolution against us. So we must keep them down. And we're seeing this in our own day, even in our own state right now with uh, anti-protest laws coming out from, uh, from the Capitol and things of that nature uh, to silence the voices to be heard. So how do you silence them? You find a way to crush people under the system. And so... Pharaoh will say that they, they being the Israelites or any foreigner in our day, will take away our freedom and power as an empire. And Pharaoh has a point. And so what happens is, is that people will use history selectively in order to benefit them. So let, let's talk about that. Uh, the the Hisoks or the, the Hyskos, I should say, uh, were Asiatic peoples like the Israelites. In fact, remember we talked about the debate that Joseph may have arisen to power during this particular empire. Uh, Hiskos means foreigner, the foreigners that came in. And they did invade and overtake Egypt. There was a time that on the throne of Egypt, there were, you know, indigenous Egyptians. There were outsiders on the throne. And so, you know, as, as it says that, as, as we said that Joseph, we're on page uh, 17, that uh, Joseph came to power under this dynasty, you know, some scholars say that. And so what this Pharaoh is, is he's using that story and saying, what if they, always the proverbial they, join these others to come against us again? We must fight for national security for us. That's what we've got to do. And so what does Pharaoh do? He, he treats them as a conquered nation he, and, and makes them slaves. In those days, you made slaves out of people whom you conquered. 
And though there wasn't a, 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 a literal war in the sense of nation fight against nation and one conquered, you define them as a nation. And then what do you have to do when you have an invading nation coming in? You must conquer them. And when you conquer them, you must subdue them. So what? You can show your power. And so, because many scholars place the Exodus during the reigns of Ramses II, who is Ramses the Great, because of the garrison or military city of Ramses, we talked about that, Ramses was known for his building and expansion of cities. You know, but an editor may have replaced the original name with Avarice with Ramses because Ramses was the better known name. And we talked about that, you know, uh, in placing the Exodus. And so what you have is that the slaves are now called to build these military cities, these storehouse cities. Some of these storehouses may have been the same type of storehouses as Joseph back in the day. They may have been military storehouses, but you make a nation which you have conquered uh, to work for you. You have to demonize them as somebody to be subjected. You have to blame them for your problems. And then when you take harsh reality, harsh uh, policies, excuse me, harsh policies against them, then the people are already programmed to go along with it. And so, so when you get a dictator or a dictator-minded person, he stirs up the nationalism there, the sense of pride of who you are as a country, and we're not talking about simple patriotism here, we're talking about something more than that. That you, and because Pharaoh and the country were one, and it's idolatry, if you believe in the power of the state, you believe in the power of God, and therefore if you want to honor God, you honor the power of the state because they are one, especially in Egyptian religion, then Whatever the Pharaoh says goes. But notice what he didn't do. Notice that there is a plan in place here. You forget what people have done for you of different peoples within your country who have contributed to society, uh, forced and unforced. You forget what pe these people have, have done in the past. So there's this sense of historical forgetfulness. See, we like to remember history, but we don't like to remember all of the history. We like certain talking points of history. So you begin to reshape the narrative. And so you begin to have this narrative that you feed to people and people who may be feeling uh, disenfranchised within your own country will say, yeah, that's right. It's their fault because we always do better, don't we? And I mean that tongue in cheek when we have an enemy to blame. And so Pharaoh needed an enemy to blame and that enemy is the Israelites. And so it goes from, they, he redefines who they are they're not the people who Joseph brought in because Joseph helped them. They're a nation. We must come against this nation in case they get other nations against us. We've already seen that in the past. Remember, selective history. And so what do we have to do? We have to, we have to conquer this nation. So what? how do we conquer them? We make them our slaves. What? To show our power against them. And so look what he did. Look what his policy did. Uh, his policy separated families, kept the community exhausted, 
and was supposed to be a deterrent to procreation. Pharaoh's thinking, if I work them hard enough and I keep them going, if I separate their families, then what? They can't get together and, and, and multiply. However, look what happened. The more that the Israelites were persecuted, the more they procreated because the persecution was supposed to strangle out the life force out of the Israelites. And so the Pharaoh underestimated the power of family and community to cling together as one flesh and to give birth to a legacy in the midst of adversity. And so this is what he, he, he figured if I just tire them out, if I separate them and, and send the men off to work in these, in these slave camps, building my cities, if I do all this, then they won't be able to be together. And I can strangle the very life out of them. And this is what oppressive systems do. They make us slaves to the system. And even if we're not literally in slavery, the system makes us slaves. If we look at how we work, if we look at what we do, uh, and, 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 and how you have to work really, really hard for very, very, very little, and the playing field is unequal, and so I tire you out to strangle the life out of you because you'll be too tired to rebel against the system. Why? Because we go from living to existence. And we do, we see this played out in our own world today. But when Pharaoh knew he could not strangle the life out of the Israelites. The more they persecuted, the more they were pro they procreated. In fact, even in the early centuries of the church, the church grew the most when they were persecuted. In fact, I believe it is Tertullian who says um, that the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs because the more they were persecuted, the more they multiplied. Why? Because there was something greater than themselves, and that greater was the kingdom of God. Their greater was their faith. And so he underestimated, as we said, the power of family and community to cling together as one flesh to give birth to a legacy in the midst of adversity. When I was, uh, when I was in Los Angeles, I would go to a uh, sunrise. Sunrise was kind of a, 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 a convalescent home, kind of like our Solarius here in Central Florida. A very nice one. And when I first started doing Bible study there, we were 60-40, 60% Jewish, 40% Christian. And the first time I was there, uh, my friend who invited me, she says, she, she goes, just build a relationship. Don't wear your collar and just, uh, just talk. And so what I began to do is to teach from the Old Testament, but which, you know, Jews call the Hebrew Bible. That's, you know, the Torah and the Tanakh and, the Tanakh and other things. And in this, we had people, we had folks sitting there who, if you looked at their wrist, they had the tattoo numbers because they were survivors of the Holocaust. And I remember one, one person asked, you know, very, very, almost with tears in his eyes, he goes, Father, can you answer me this? Why do people hate us, hate the Jews? You know, why are they persecuting us? And in my head, I, I must admit, I'm praying. And I'm like, God, how do I, 
answer this question in a, in a meaningful way. And so it almost came that I, that, that, I, that I flipped the question. The spirit gave me wisdom and discernment to flip the question. And the, and the flip was, how throughout all of these centuries through persecutions have Jewish folk survived? God's hand must be on them in some way for them to survive all of the atrocities. And the same thing can be said about our own African-American community, you know, surviving after all these things. Because God's hand in the midst of the chaos was working even behind the scenes working it for good, even though it wasn't good and God didn't cause it and God wasn't the author of it. God don't need evil to get his plan across. But because we're fallen human beings, God's a good chess player. So he'll use our move and move maneuver around it to get his work done. And so that's the thing here. He's like, why? And that was my answer. And he, he nodded and I was, and I was shocked, kind of scared, you know, who am I to offer an answer like this? But I was very honored and, and privileged to uh, offer that, that answer. And so that's, but that, but that is the, the, an example of the power of family and community to cling together as one flesh, to cling to faith, to cling to the promises of God in the midst of adversity. So when Pharaoh knew he could not take them out, Pharaoh has to up the ante, and there's always an up of the ante. So Pharaoh, and we're on F on 17, imposes infanticide on the Hebrew baby boys. So Pharaoh cannot stop the Israelites from becoming an increasing threat to the state because forced labor only increased fertility and fruitfulness. And that, that's not only, as we said, in a physical state, a procreation, but it does that in a, in a spiritual state and an emotional state because what it does is it begins to fuse people together. And I want to read this note, and I'll, I'll talk about this note, and I, and I quoted it directly from uh, the, um, the commentary because I think it's so fascinating. That the verse, this verse, talking about the first labor to serve. Let me look at the verse to make sure I got it right. In verse 11, so the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. And so now, not only are they going to do it, we're going to talk about how this forced labor led to a fantasize. So we're still talking about the serving and the labor. So that word for slave, that word to serve, uh, this verse contains an important repetition of the Hebrew verbal root abad, to serve, the significance of which the English reader will simply miss unless it's pointed out. The word has a wide range of meaning in Hebrew, much broader than the range of meaning of any word in the English available to translate it. In its verb usage, it can mean uh, work, serve, labor, perform, do, make, all these things. But it also can mean worship, live for, be under the control of. Its noun usages mean, uh, depending upon the context, work, service, or labor, performance, effort, accomplishment, task. And worship and obligation and ministry. Notice in this slavery, the spiritual components by it. 
that you will serve me, you will worship me, you will be bound by me because I am your God. Pharaoh is telling the Israelites, I am your God and I am in control of your destiny. And because I am in control of your destiny, he made them slaves or to serve. And though it means work, serve, and labor, it also can be made worship. I am going to break you down until you convert to my ways and give in. Because slavery or servanthood is a conversion of person. Now, we do see sometimes servanthood being used in a good way. You know, Paul will say, I'm a servant of God. Uh, because, you know, I, I, it, it is an obligation. I, I, I work, but it is also a way of showing worship to God. And so who you work for and labor for and perform for is who you worship. And so the system is built by design so that you will idolize and think that this system is your sufficiency. Instead of saying, you know what? God is the God who is over systems and God can use a system or God can dismantle a system. But my ultimate sufficiency and provision is in God. And any time we live under uh, the, the oppressive thought of an economics of scarcity, we're afraid to give because we're afraid that we won't have for ourselves. Or we limit who we give to because they ain't us. We have now become a slave to a de demonic system. And in this case, the Israelites had no choice because it was imposed on them. And so what an oppressor does is he gets us to thinking just like him, just like the system. And what the kingdom of God calls us to, this inbreaking of the kingdom of God that we see embodied in Jesus, we see previews in Moses, says that there's another system at play that challenges the systems of this world, challenges, as Paul will call them, the principalities and powers. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That doesn't mean principalities and powers don't use uh, flesh and blood. And so when we stand up to the principalities and powers, there needs to be a spiritual component with that. This is why you just can't oppose uh, uh, things just on political means. If you don't have a spiritual grounding, if, if your protest is not grounded in prayer, then you will protest in vain because you will burn out. Because what happens is, what if we keep on protesting and nothing changes? What if, we, if he keeps on saying no? We will see that in our text later on. So, so we have to be grounded in prayer. And this is why being grounded in God, God being the ultimate, um, ultimate ground of being. In him, we move and have our being. This is why this is so important to us. And so the commentator goes on to say, later in Exodus, Moses will use the word, this word to serve. In the Hebrew, frequently to refer to Israel's desire to worship, live for, and be under the control of Yahweh. At this point in the narrative, Israel has involuntarily having to serve and work and live for and be under the control of Pharaoh. Remember, and we'll get to this text. Remember when he says, let my people go to go and worship. And we were like, why is Moses using that tactic? Because it does, it doesn't make sense. And to why would Pharaoh say no to that? I mean, we would think on a practical level, they run away to worship and then they run away. 
But Pharaoh himself knows that to live in complete freedom is to serve the living God. And this God, Yahweh, is going to challenge uh, his power, which we will see. And so look what, I, I do want to finish this up before we go. It says that what Israel needed was not independence from Pharaoh and Egypt per se, but a shift of dependency, a switching of masters from Pharaoh and the Egyptians to the true and living God. Because the Israelites had to be free in their mind before they were ever free in their body because they had to get their mind right. There needed to be a conversion of the mind. Who am I really serving, even in the midst of all this mess? That God, that the God I'm serving is going to overturn these powers. The God I'm serving, I know it doesn't happen, it ain't happening today. But I do believe in that day when it will happen. And there's a dangerous, dangerous danger. When people begin to hope again, when people begin to hope beyond themselves and a power greater than themselves and a God who they believe in, who has control and work in everything for their good, even when it's not good, those are dangerous people. And they're dangerous because they will speak against the principalities and powers of their day. So they needed to get out from under an oppressive leader so as to be under a, 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 a a munificent one, a, a beneficial one, no longer serving Pharaoh, but serving God. We all serve something in our lives. The question is, who do we serve and what do we serve? Do we serve ourselves? Do we serve other people? Uh, and I mean serving other people in the bad way, not in the good way. Uh, do we put things above God, even good things? Who's our master? Who do we work for? And I can tell you this, and I will say this, you can be, you can have, um, you can look at God just like Pharaoh. What do I mean by that? That my service to God is out of fear. And I'm not talking about respect for God or, or the fear of God as the Bible talks about it, but as in a fear that I serve God because I don't want to, you know, go to hell. Some people say, or I don't want God to get me. And so what we've done is when we think of our God like that, we put him in the place of Pharaoh. And a lot of times people do the right things for the wrong reasons. And they're good deeds. And that's why Jesus, when he comes along, says, you need to check your heart. Because in the Bible... Jesus will say, I no longer call you what? Servants, but I call you my what? Friends. You're a friend of the king. Oh, yes, there are loyalties. We have to be loyal, but there are benefits. And so we have to ask ourselves, who are we serving? Because we're always going to be serving someone or something in our lives. And so the richness of this vocabulary and the ambiguity of it and the overtones it creates are part of this book's stylistic impact on the reader and yet constitute a frequent problem for the translator. So nevertheless, as he points out, we will do our best to put the nuances in. But I love that this commentator basically said that we, he notices that it's the same word, to serve. Because the writer of Exodus and, if it's, and in some ways, it flows from uh, the life of Moses. It's asking us a better que at the question, what system do we serve? What system are we complicit in? What system have we, uh, that has been wound and bound on us that we need to wake up to be free from? And what systems do we allow to be wound and bound on us? And so I'm going to stop right there because we're going to get into a, 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 a section on the infanticide that uh, next week. So I just want to open up for thoughts, questions, concerns. Let's 
How does this apply to us, to our day? So I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourselves and I'm gonna go back to gallery view so that we can have some discussion on this. What do you see in all this? Well, Pastor, first of all, uh, the, uh, I guess the similarity between what we just went through with the mm -hmm. train is sort mm -hmm. of right there. All of the stuff that has been done, all the things that are going on with Black Lives Matter, with, with the rising up and the, mm -hmm. the it's, it's all the same. Um, it's like nothing new. We're going through the same cycle that has been happening in the Bible for all these days. And it's just, it's just hilarious to me that it was written all those many years ago, but it's still happening today. And so the answer must still be today the same, that we've got to not be under that impression, but to cling unto God and get back to, back to the wholeness of him. Yeah, and I was going to say, um, follow what Ernie said, is that history repeats itself over and over. Uh, and one thing, Father, that hit me today when you said, cling to the promises of God. And, 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 and you mentioned that civil religion. Mm -hmm. And we know down through history, the clamoring for power and prestige. And that brought uh, us to America as slaves mm -hmm. for power uh, and, uh, and prestige. And then emancipation came and, and we got a little too much. And then that brought on the KKK, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Jim Crow, yeah. the separate but equal. And then we got a little too much more. We messed around and had a black president. So yep. now we got the Proud Boys mm -hmm. and the QAnon people. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these people form yep. this civil religion. Exactly. That, uh, for this power. But, uh, but uh, praise be to God, we are different people. Uh, we are separate people and we stand on the promises of God. And so we have to remember in spite of all of this, uh, what <laughs> Joe Biden called uncivil unrest, even down to the pandemic and the number of people who die every day as Christians, uh, we are supposed to be different and we know that through it all, mm. we, cling, we cling through the promises mm -hmm. of God. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to be as upset as I get some nights watching, tea, watching the news, you know, because it would drive you crazy. But, but we have to remember that we serve a living God and we cling to his promises. Yeah, yeah. Anybody yeah, I have, I, I have a question. I may have an answer. We'll, we'll, we'll try. Yes. <laughs> That's why I tell it's people I may have an answer. <laughs> it's a reflective question because this is, I mean, we've lived this all our lives. We can all quote examples of your experience with the, the guy who is a Jew um, asking why do they hate us and so forth. My my question is, and you know, all about your faith in God is what, you know, gets you through along with some other actions. But my question is, what is the lesson for the oppressor? We, we hear a lot of lessons of faith for those who are oppressed. Right. We know about the suffering right. of those who are oppressed. I mean, we could write our own books on it. And the Bible, you know, has just a wealth of that kind of information. Where is our teachings for those who oppress biblically based? That's my question. I, I will try to answer this. So, so in during apartheid, 
uh, in the Truth and Reconciliation, uh, Desmond Tutu would talk about, and, and Nelson Mandela would talk about uh, the conversion of the oppressor, meaning that because the oppressor participates in violence, I'm going to use the term victim, but I don't mean it in the same way that who he victimized, okay? They, they've also been enslaved by the system. And so, so that's why Jesus will say this, love your enemies. You know, this is why Jesus on the cross is saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, I don't know if I'd be saying, Father, forgive them. I say, Father, forget them. And probably a stronger word that usually has the same letter. <laughs> let's just be real and be honest. Let's just, let's just yeah. call it like it is. Uh, it, it, the, the, the thing to the oppressor is this. The lesson is, if you don't change, you will be turned over to the judgment of God. God will lead you to your own devices. Again and again, as we go throughout this story, God gave Pharaoh over and over and over and over again to repent. Moses, Pharaoh, do it. And then Pharaoh gets jailhouse religion. Oh, I've changed, I've changed, just let it go. And God goes, we'll relent in order to put more pressure into more pressure. In fact, what you realize about Pharaoh is Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And we'll get into what that means. But he, his heart was already turned over to evil. But and what about those? What about those who have, who realize that they're part of the oppressive system, that their ancestors perpetuated that oppression? Mm -hmm. My ancestors perpetuated this oppression. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know, I, 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 I know, I know stories of my own, own like grandparents and crazy things that happen. Mm -hmm. And so what you, what, you, what you leave in that is that God will deal with the oppressor who's totally hardened that they'll never change. God gonna take them folk out one way or the other. God don't play. But for those in the meantime, and what you do see is, is that the people who left with the Israelites, their, their, num their numbers were numerous when they left Egypt. Why? Because there were people who realized that the Egyptian uh, system was oppressive to them and they left with them. You, we all read that in the Bible. Some Egyptians, that's why the Bible calls them in numbers, the mixed group, because you had people joining this Israelite movement. And so I think, mm -hmm. I think the lessons are twofold when it comes to power and the oppressor. If you keep doing your thing, your heart's going to be hardened and God going to turn you over to your devices. I think we're already seeing that. And you know, another thing I thought what came to mind about um, um, Kay's question, and I guess this still might put some of it back on, on the oppressed, but the first thing I thought about was um, <laughs> the song, There Are No We Are Christians by Love. And, and I thought about the way of love that Jesus taught, turn the other cheek. Uh, Martin Luther King, the nonviolent resistance. Uh, and some of us, uh, Pete, and I don't know, maybe some of you can remember back during the civil rights struggle when they were letting the dogs and the water hoses. Mm -hmm. One thing uh, mm -hmm. Connell said, don't let them pray. Remember the protesters would gather and they would pray before they started their march. And he was adamant about that. Don't let them pray. Um, so I, I think in a way we bring them in to our, we bring the oppressors into our way by trying to be more Christ-like, uh, uh, showing them the way of love, uh, which is a... <laughs> A long, hard struggle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I do believe me, that, that. Yeah, go ahead, Faye. Can I just no? I just ahead. say what you're saying. It's a really deep, and really, I I ask that because of conversations I'm having with others right now. Um, you know, reading about the dynamics of the relationship of those who um, oppress, those who are in the dominant 
Mm -hmm. um, having read the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson and mm -hmm. watched a couple of movies and then the Bible, mm -hmm. all of it is similar. Mm -hmm. And is. There, is quite a, there is quite a bit that's placed on the oppressor yeah. to still dis, you know, in, embrace love and forgiveness. <laughs> Uh, and so, and I, and I guess my question is constantly, we do talk about that and, but we, I just, for myself never hear, there are examples of what happened with the press mm -hmm. you know, other than if we are to say our, our re responses, mm -hmm or to help the oppressor. That's what it almost sounds like what Lorraine was saying. Yeah, and unless you want to turn, do like Moses, <laughs> just touch that water and shock them with their, all the water turning into blood. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, I, I do want to say, well, I want to put something in this. You cannot have yeah. repentance, okay, without accountability. Yeah. And that's, and I think that's where the rubber meets the road and all the conversations we're talking about in our, in our post world right now, post administration world. Uh, let's just have unity. Those calls for unity. Those calls for unity cannot be without serious talks and accountability of, of events that have happened, not only now, but the events that led up to where we're at in this present moment. Mm. Um, and, 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 and I, I can give you an example. I give you an example from my own life and my own journey of this transformation and, 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 and things of that nature. Um, and I, it's still a journey, but I remember back in the protest and everybody's coming together. And I would tell, you know, I, I've had to modify this thing, but the thing I'd say is this can't be a cavalier moment. Oh, we all come together and sweep everything under the rug. Does that make sense? It has to be a Kairos moment and in breaking Kairos uh, in the scriptures is the fullness of time. Remember in Galatians, it talks about in the fullness of time uh, that Jesus was born of Mary, born of a woman. That fullness, that time when God breaks in, this kingdom time. And everybody was coming together and, and blacks and whites and everybody and, you know, everybody's crying and praying and so forth. And, you know, everybody was saying, you know, please forgive me and I'm sorry. And I remember I was at a, 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 a protest event. It was a smaller event because, you know, because of the pandemic. And the Lord and the spirit convicted me from white people's in. We as white people can never ask for forgiveness. And I will nuance this, so, so roll with me on this. Because what happens when white people ask for forgiveness, be it in a church context or a political context, is we're making a theological statement and demanding forgiveness. Well, you have to. Why? And then we, we, we take Jesus out of context. Does that make sense? Because Jesus mm -hmm. said so. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, we got to sweep this under the rug. And I knew that when I would say that I'm sorry, I knew that in my mind, there was a sense of we need to repent and we need to have reparations and all this kind of stuff. I knew that in my mind. But I said, white people can say I'm sorry. But white people cannot ask for forgiveness. I'm just going to put it out there. Because forgiveness is something worked out in a community mm -hmm. and forgiveness has always worked out with repentance. Does that make sense? Am I, am I making, <laughs> I because sometimes, you. Uh, because, <laughs> because, you know, it's been, oh, let's just sweep it under the, the rug and we're, yay, mm -hmm. you know, and we then repeat the same cycle and we never break the mm -hmm. generational cycle right. from and, the and original it, sin of, of slavery mm -hmm. and other atrocities. Yeah. And that filters over, it filtered over from, uh, the slave and the slave owner, uh, segregation and uh, desegregation because there was no reciprocity. Nope. No reciprocity. 
the uh, oppressor mm -hmm. would uh, forgive and ask forgiveness, but it was different when when the oppress when the person who was well, I mean, the oppressed would ask, mm -hmm. but when the oppressor, it's like oh yes, yeah, the re reciprocity is not there. It's like uh, I have more power, you know. I don't have to apologize to you. That's it. <laughs> uh, and so we can we see that playing out all 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 the way down, and that's something that's deeply embedded, and I don't know how you get to it and, and on a on an individual level you pray uh when when you do have that encounter when a person does uh uh sincerely apologize that you'll be wise enough to know it that it comes from the heart because because we deal with this very unusual relationship. Yeah. Um I would just like to say um, with the oppressors, um, it's uh, not always our job to uh, do anything about, you know, the oppressor. Uh, some things we have to leave up to God and they will be taken care of whether they, um, say they're sorry to us and not. Um, there's that final uh, judgment. And uh, sometimes you just have to lead people, I guess, to that, um, let them go through that judgment and not try to judge them. Uh, that's uh, judging them sort of make them put on the face of, you know, I, I am so sorry. Uh, but if it's not coming from the heart, then uh, God will take care of that. Because um, I think uh, one of the scriptures probably coming up about the midwives, it said they fear God. So they didn't do, you know, what was request. So, um, these people that uh, do not feel uh, fear God, uh, the only thing we can do is pray that they will fear God because we won't, you know, have the ability to, uh, you know, turn them around or whatever. It's just in this life, we're limited. So <laughs> our goal is to uh you know get to god get to heaven um and some things we just you know have to let go otherwise it'll interfere with um our serving god if we get too wrapped up in you know what they are doing to us as far and, as uh, and that yes and that is what has carried us through right. centuries Mm -hmm. it, it really is a lot of that. Yeah. It's that resilience, that faith in God. Mm -hmm. um, my, you know, so my question was in the Bible, where are there examples of outcomes of the oppressor other than, you know, their mm -hmm. kingdoms falling right. over so many years or. Well, when you think about them crossing um, the, red, was the Red Sea? <laughs> Um, when Pharaoh's people, the Jewish people crossed over, when Pharaoh's people came in, they were washed away because the water came back and, you know, God had his hand on that and he took care of them. So we have to keep in mind that God will take care of certain, you know, things that we can. It, it goes back to cling to the promises of God. Mm -hmm. I am what he said. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Who I will be. And I even cause to be what is. So mm -hmm. we have to
cling to that. To cling that, to yeah. God's and promises. I think a lot of people will we be, do uh, will be uh, surprised that they will not be, you know, go home to God. Yeah, Ernie, I, I saw you. If you go look ahead. at Paul, Paul was an oppressor. And I've heard you say, Pastor, that some people do the right thing for the wrong reason. And he was in that thing, not even realizing that he was doing the wrong thing. Many oppressors believe that they're doing the right thing. And mm -hmm. God intervened in the situation. <laughs> now, Thank in you. Paul's case, he got redemption and turned around and became as great a uh, uh, a preacher and and what as he was an oppressor. So there is the God equation that you have to say in the midst of that, but God, you know, and we never know what God is going to do or how he's going to do it, but he can take that oppressor and turn turn that whole thing around. And the very one that ended up oppressing you might be the very one that brings deliverance to the people or who's ever there. So that's a, 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 an example of an oppressor of God answering a biblical thing of him answering to that situation. Right, yep. and we're better off putting our en emphasis or and service to God than uh, trying to, you know, determine what God is going to do to the other people. Because those that fear God are not going to do certain things. Mm. You just won't, you, you know. But we and, still have to have a voice. And so we, we, mm -hmm. we've got to keep certain things yeah, in balance. Sometimes, sometimes people will use will use the, the excuse of prayer so they won't have to do anything. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be very careful we do not do that. You know, as, mm -hmm. as Abraham Heschel, the famous Jewish rabbi, to paraphrase him when he was marching with King, he says, you know, we, we march with our feet and we pray in the streets. You know, that <laughs> this is prayer. He's praying. So we've got to be careful. And there are certain things that, you know, when you, when you said that there, there are, there are certain things that the the oppressor and the oppressive class have to talk about, and those who have been enlightened in that class. So it should be me talking to other white people about white privilege. Why? Because we created the system. We benefit from the system. You know, this is the system we created, and we have to dismantle it. And we should not put on the burden of any of our, and I'm beyond African-Americans, minority brothers and sisters and siblings saying, oh, what should we be doing? Well, hell, we know what we should be doing. We know what is right, excuse the way I put it, but come on. We know we benefit from this. But what happens is uh, in all of this is that if you look at, and, and I have to cr credit uh, Dr. Uh, William Barber on this for the Poor People's Campaign, Go look him up on YouTube. Listen to his sermons. They're just great. He's great. History. I know. Yeah. I'm, I, this is why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign for the state of Florida, because yeah. I heard, hear his sermons. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about the basically what he calls the three reconstructions, the one after the Civil War, civil rights, and now that is going on. And he says the reason they were thwarted is because the powers that be realized how to divide people. He says, because in, after the Civil War, you actually had poor whites uh, partnering with former slaves and, and, and as, a moral, as a moral movement for the, for, for the greater good because the poor whites realized, well, my God, we have been hoodwinked in the Civil War. <laughs> because, you know, as, now think about this. Now think about this very carefully. And he, he or she to have ears, let them hear. The Civil War in the South was a rich man's battle, but a poor man's fight. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yes. what do rich oppressors do? They get poor people to fight for them. But I'm just talking about times and past. I'm not talking about today, am I? <laughs> Those who have ears, hear. So, so, so what, so what the, so what the white ruling class does, we need to separate 
them white people, white poor peoples from, from those other people. Because they, if they all get together, then they'll realize, hey, we can demand a right to sit at the table. We can change some things. So what did, what did the Pharaoh of those days say to the, to the poor white people? Them folk are getting your stuff. Them folk are getting your stuff. You're better than that. And what comes out of that? Let's build participation statues called Confederate statues in the 1900s to do that. Does that make sense? So, so that's how it works. Same thing in the civil rights movement. The next campaign that King was doing was the poor people's campaign. And many of folks will say that's what got him shot because now he's challenging the narrative with poor white people saying, poor white people, you are in the same boat with the people that you despise. They don't care about you either. Now watch what happened now. We have, we have, a, we, 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 we have a president who comes to power. What does he capitalize on? Then people are getting your job, poor white people. Then people are trying to take away your identity. You don't want them foreigners coming in. And so he divided it. And so that's what happens. That's, that's how an oppressor can come in. Oh. And, and even those people who finally wake up, who may be of the same nationality or skin color or class of the oppressor, wow, wow we're, we're getting messed up in this too. Because if you get that kind of moral movement in America or any other country, you will see a demand for change. And this is what we're seeing. This is what we just saw. But let's not ever get it twisted. No political party is going to bring in the kingdom of God. Yeah. None. No, not one. Because conservatives and liberals got together in Jesus' day and they crucified him. Let's just call it. So we have, to account, we have to hold people accountable no matter what political affiliation they are, no matter what they claim to be, we need to hold them accountable. And that's the prophetic voice of the church. But that prophetic voice is energized by priestly intercession, by praying. So it's not an either or. Also, that's where the oppressor gets. That's where oppressive religion gets and say, hey, y'all just pray about it. Don't be about it. Y'all just worry <laughs> about souls. Because if you start worrying about bodies, uh, then, then, then you're going to start worrying about why is my body being treated uh, worse than other people's bodies? See, that's where the slaveholders' religion came in. Well, well fine. They can, be, they can have a soul, and we can save their souls and use religion to oppress, but you're three-fifths of a person under the Constitution because we don't want you to have rights. See how that works? Right. Yeah. This is the danger of, of, of even in our own religion. Now, 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 hear me out. You know, yes, you die and you go to heaven. But when you make heaven the final destination of God's plan, you miss it. God's final destination is what we talk about in the church is the resurrection of the body. Why is there a redemption of the body and why does it matter? Because if the body is transformed in the future, then the down payment of that by the Holy Spirit is mean that transformation needs to happen now because God cared about a body. God became one of us in Jesus. So he comes one of us in Jesus. Jesus dies. Jesus is lynched upon a tree by a corrupt religious and political system. Humanity said no. God says yes, raised him from the dead in a physical body. Got some new cool properties, physical body. God is saying, I value the body. So don't you ever have, and if you have a religion in my name that loves the soul and despises the body, says, oh yeah, we'll save your soul, but we're going to beat your body. That's not Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's Plato. <laughs> These are why our doctrines matter. This is why the doctrine of the incarnation matters. God coming in the flesh, identifying with us. Jesus' death, but not only his death, but his resurrection. And it matters not only because at the last day, our bodies will be raised, and maybe I won't have to work out so hard in the last and great day. Mm -hmm. I have me a good body. <laughs> but that body matters today. Paul will say that the things we do in this body today matters at the last day. So there's a connection between the two. And this is why we fight for the transformation 
of society with the kingdom of God, knowing that we're not bringing it in by our own power, knowing that at the end of time, Jesus is going to have to you know, wrap this thing up because we can't do it. But we give people a preview and we model a preview of the kingdom of God that says, don't you want to be a part of this kingdom? We walk in the way of love that cast out fear. And this is how we can make it. And this is who we are as the church. Oh, yeah. This is why I emphasize certain things at church and, and why we go out in our community and we are present in our community and we're helping people no matter who they are and where they come from and what they've done and not done. Because in the midst of this pandemic, we're modeling what the church should be. Yeah. So that post-pandemic, when people want to gather again, hey, I might want to go gather with them people because them people's over there helped me. Mm -hmm. So this is why everything is so interconnected. And while we're interconnected, and this is why you have to tell the oppressor, you're in interconnected with the oppressed, even though you want to say you're different. That why well, I'm better than them. God, God no, you ain't. Because everybody stands under the judgment of the cross. And if you want to know how power should be handled, God gives up all of his power, so to speak, and, and hands him over to be crucified by his own creation. Mm. And I'll stop right there. I'm sorry. I, I, I have been working really hard with the poor people's campaign, community organizing, talking to people about the kingdom of God, you know, and, 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 and you know, talking about Jesus. Uh, had a great conversation with our Muslim brothers and sisters too. But this is the legacy of our church, St. John's. All I'm doing in anything that I do. It is is investing a legacy that was handed to us. We can't live off of that legacy anymore because there will come a day when people don't know the stories of this church. That's why I'm emphasizing we start telling our stories and recording our stories. Why? So we can invest that legacy into future generations. You have stories to tell that my generation needs to hear because we going through the same cycle of the 60s again. It's a whole, you know, just for the, the 21st century, or we're going through the same cycle of what Moses did. And this is why this story of Moses is endearing. And this story and the, and the metaphors mm -hmm. of Moses and the Exodus are repeated throughout the books of Isaiah, the prophets, and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Even in the New Testament, Jesus picks up on those themes in ways. Jesus is, 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 is given us an Exodus out of slavery and sin and death and those things that destroy. So I apologize for going long. Uh, we will nope, pick this up. That's great. We went long. <laughs> we know, but I'm glad right. we're having this conversation. The reason I give topic. you these Bible studies yeah. is that- uh, Father Charles, yes, could uh, yes. you include Bishop Wright, Episcopal Bishop of Northern Georgia in your prayers. He is uh, positive for the coronavirus. That's right. Let's let's keep and this. Some of you may first. know him from UB, but mm -hmm. it's uh, Bishop Wright, Northern, Northeastern yeah, or Northern Georgia. Yeah, basically, uh, the, for lack of a better term, the Bishop of Atlanta, right? That area, mm -hmm. right up there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And more, more, and beyond, but B Bishop of that area. So let's pray for him. Let's pray for everybody. Um, we do have a tentative, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this here. We do have a tentative, um, we'll probably do Ann Hill's funeral 3 p.m. on Saturday. We were gonna do it at 10, but we couldn't. So I'll just let you know on that. Um, uh, and we'll get, I'll have more information on Sunday. We'll send it out in the email as well, just uh, uh, doing that. So yes, the Diocese of Atlanta, that's the Diocese. Okay. <laughs> um, and so let's, let's pray for one another in the midst of this. Let's continue this legacy. Let's join hands and together and bring everyone in the fight uh, because we need everyone to do this work. Amen? Amen. Until, yes, 3 p.m. Saturday for Ann Hill. Uh, Tracita must be typing in somewhere. I see that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. So pray for one another. Be present with one another. I'll see some of y'all on uh, next week. I'll see some of y'all on Sunday. And in the various ways I see you, I love you. I'm praying for you and pray for me too. Yes. As we're in this together. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.
Bye bye. Oh, oh just one last what, thing before what? we leave. Uh, Ernie will be preaching twelve thirty noonday prayer uh, noonday Eucharist tomorrow. So tune okay. in to our YouTube to hear Ernie preach tomorrow. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. All right. See y'all later. <laughs> did you get? Bye -bye. Uh, did you get my email? No, I. I sent I'll you. Look. I'll get the sermon so that you can look at it. Okay. Okay. All, All right. right. See you uh, later. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.